awkward angle, but there it is. Okay, let's see, close. All right, so I hope you guys were able to access that table on Excel. If you guys haven't yet, um, I would highly recommend look, at least looking through it. I would make flashcards based on this, um, at least for these chapters. And uh, you can sort this stuff, like it has like the species names. So you can sort it like alphabetically to like mix it up so that you, you know, right now the way that I typed it out was like per chapter. So per system, basically. So you want to mix it up from that and test yourself or mix it up based on the disease names and that sort of stuff, just to give a little bit of variety. Um, that's, I think, would be uh, useful. Um, final. Why it shows it like that? Okay. Why are some computers that let me do it and others won't? I'll probably bring up the whole thing so we can see the notes for everybody. Because if you guys didn't know, a lot of these slides have like notes at the bottom of them. And yeah, I mean to ask the questions and you're meant to think about it, but I'd still rather you guys be able to see the notes then not, and maybe I'll just scroll through it like this, actually, now that I think about it. Um, does it say that it's recording? Is that that right? Okay. Okay, yeah, it is recording. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so yeah, I'll probably just keep it like this and then just pop these notes in and out whenever we get to the answer part, right? The notes will appear at the bottom there, just FYI, so you guys know where to look for it. Um, if you guys ever do get onto PowerPoint, um, and like, you know, uh, a lot of my lectures might have notes there. You've been missing them, so FYI. So final exam, we already know it's about. So essentially what is gonna happen with these questions, I'm gonna give you a pathogen name or a disease name, something like that, and you'll give me information I ask for. If I give you a pathogen, what disease does it cause? What kind of organism is it? That sort of thing. Um, then I'll ask about concept. I'm not gonna like sit here and wait for you to answer it necessarily, but I'll say it and then like, you know, short pause for you guys to kind of think about it or look it up if you want to, but then we're gonna move on, right? Um, there's no points or anything. It's not an assignment. This is just for kind of recall purposes. Um, I, I want you guys to try to challenge yourself from memory however you can, but you're, of course, able to um, follow along with this thing or with the notes, whatever works for you, um, as far as kind of understand what you're talking about. Just refresh your memory about these diseases that we learned about. So we'll start off with the spongy form encephalopathies. So our question, first question here, spongy form encephalopathies, which type of pathogen causes this disease? So typically here, I want to hear like bacteria, virus, protozoan, helminth, fungi type of stuff, right? But for this one, it's special, right? This is prions. So they are protein molecules. They're just protein. So in what unique way do they cause disease? Well, I mean, <laughs> they're proteins that kind of stick together and cause um, you know, uh, damage to the brain from them sticking together. So how would we sterilize these guys? We sterilize these guys, we have to use extra high heat, so about 135 degrees uh, Celsius in an autoclave. Normally we autoclave at about 121 degrees Celsius. And you also wanna treat it with sodium hydroxide before you autoclave it to help denature the protein. We wanna get rid of it, that protein's shape as much as possible. Um, this is such an awkward thing, but I can't handle this. All right, what did I say with the notes? Okay, I need extra protein for All right, next thing. So pop those down. Okay, Yersinia pestis. What type of organism is this pathogen? So anybody remember for this one? Yes, exactly. So it is bacterial. Good job. It is bacteria. Um, it happens to be gram negative. That's not. I'm not going to test you on that part though. Um, it. What diseases is it associated with? So yes, so the plague. So this includes all three kinds of the plague, the bubonic, 
the pneumonic and the septicemic. So we're going to talk about what those mean. Bubonic, a bubo is an infection in the actual lymph node. Um, the pneumonic, you know, the lungs pneumonia associated with that and the respiratory version. And then the septicemic, where you have the infection spreading throughout the bloodstream. Whenever you have this uh, spreading throughout the bloodstream, uh, that can affect the circulation ability of oxygen to get to certain areas. That can be due to the inflammation or just bacterial effects in the blood itself. But anyway, that leads to um, necrosis, uh, death in the extremities, um, and that turns black. And that's why it's called the black plague. So the black plague is associated with septicemic. So how is Yersinia pestis transmitted? This one, guys, it should be kind of one that we all remember, right? It's going to be flea bites, and it's maintained in rodent populations. We think of it as being with rats like in, back in the Middle Ages and stuff, but uh, now we have prairie dogs that harbor it in the United States. So that's our notes, make sure I didn't miss anything. No, I did not. Okay. Next disease, we have infectious mononucleosis. What is the pathogen that causes this disease? And I'm just gonna group in with it. What type of organism is that pathogen? Does anybody know any of that? Is it by roots? Yes, it is a virus, exactly. They may know the name of it. It's okay if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I leave the PowerPoint about it. Um, the Epstein bar. Right, <laughs> that's right, I remember now. Yeah, uh, yeah, so fair enough, right? Uh, yeah, so Epstein bar virus. So this is a virus. And now I mentioned here Burkitt's lymphoma. This is on your review slides. So that's why I am including this in here, okay? We didn't focus a lot on it, but Burkitt's lymphoma is a type of cancer that we see associated with HIV infection. It's a lymphoma caused by this virus. Now, Epstein-Barr virus is a herpes virus, so um, it will hide out in the cells and everything like that, but whenever it is uh, incorporating itself that way, that can lead to um, development of cancer that our cells, our bodies, normally will be fighting off. But when you have HIV, it can't maintain that. So Burkitt's lymphoma is a sign usually of HIV infection. So I believe that's it for that one. Let's double check. Yes. Okay. Campylobacter jejunum, or just Campylobacter is typically how we talk about it. Okay, what disease or diseases does this pathogen Cause. Anybody remember this one? This one is diarrhea. It's like food associated diarrhea. Um, and what type of a pathogen is this? So, you know, viral, what, whatever else. Anybody have a guess on that? This one is bacteria. Yeah. And how is this one transmitted? This is going to be food borne. So, typically, it's going to be associated with, you know, fecal oral that gets contamination into the food. Um, this, is a, this is a bacteria that can be found in a lot of places, so it's not always associated with fecal oral root. It can just be natural on certain surfaces or organisms typically. But yeah, it's a pretty common bacteria. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, okay. All right, next we have tuberculosis. Um, tuberculosis, what is the name, the whole name of the pathogen that causes this? So this one, I'll go ahead and give it to you. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacterium. So uh, that's important and we'll talk about that here in a moment, but in which phase of tuberculosis do you see the worst symptoms presented as what we call consumption? So coughing up uh, maybe a green or bloody sputum, um, wasting away and um, so uh, anorexia, so not eating. And there's all sorts of stuff that's associated with consumption, why we call it consumption, right? So this is associated with the reactivation phase or the secondary phase of tuberculosis. The primary phase when you're initially infected is not associated with these nasty symptoms typically. All right, two tests um, to diagnose this illness. I would say that there are more than two that would be available, but uh, probably first uh, you might test depending on why you're there in the hospital, right? So maybe you're a nurse and you're going to a new hospital to go work there and they require that you get tested for having ever been exposed to tuberculosis, you get the PPD skin test, right? So that's one way we can see if you've been exposed to tuberculosis or may even carry tuberculosis. Um, if you have a patient, 
a lot of times this is the case with um, homeless individuals who have come in off the street and are having um, you know, coughing up blood and things like that. We will collect their sputum sample and then do an acid fast stain on that sputum directly. You can also culture it and then acid fast stain that or do other tests with it, but acid fast, right? So we have PBD, we have the acid fast stain, and then we have chest x-rays, which are also extremely important in diagnosing tuberculosis. You need to do at least two of these in order to say that somebody would have tuberculosis. Um, and of course, you can always confirm with like PCR and stuff like that, but these are like your first, like you think somebody has tuberculosis, do these, and then you say, okay, yeah, probably it is, then confirm with the PCR or whatever. That's the idea with that one. Of course, the reason that I was bringing up mycobacterium tuberculosis is simply because of that acid fast stain. Acid fast stain is used to identify mycobacterium, right? And what they have in their surface of their cells. So they test gram positive, but on the outside of their cells, they have this waxy substance called mycolic acid. And that is what is gonna interact with that carbol fusion stain if we were using carbol fusion. Um, and then trap that, whereas normal cell walls can't do that. So it'll trap that in and um, be selected basically for those. They'll turn pink and then the negative cells will turn blue. I'm sure you guys definitely remember that from the lab exam. So let me make sure this is, I feel like there is a lot about that one. Okay, next we have primary amoebic meningoencephalitis, All right? What pathogen causes this? Now this is just one. So uh, we can talk about meningoencephalitis, but primary amoebic meningoencephalitis or PAM is caused by one organism. And the pathogen, does anybody know, remember before I just like speak steamroll over everybody, anybody remember what the organism is or what kind of organism it is? Okay, right. so this is, uh, um, Sorry, I just made my brain, like I said, looked up about amoeba, amoeba and I was like, of course it's amoeba, but like what kind of organism is that, right? So uh, this is gonna be Neglaria phalari. That is the exact organism, the species name associated with this, Neglaria phalari. And this is amoeba, yes, but that is a type of protozoa. So it's just one of the classifications of protozoa. Um, and it's transmitted through warm, it's like in warm water, right? Warm, fresh water, you get it up into your sinus cavities and then it can travel into the brain from there. Uh, so this is the brain-eating amoebas. Remember, this is going to have a 97 to 98% fatality rate, and it happens pretty quickly. There's usually no treatment involved for this. Uh, the other one that was associated with meningoencephalitis, the GAM, so that's um, granulomatous amoebic meningoencephalitis. That one is a canth amoeba, just FYI, and that is on the chart as well. All right, malaria. What type of pathogen causes this? Anybody know? So this one is a protozoa. Again, so this is what we call an AP complexin. So the other one is amoeba. This one is AP complexin. These guys are all parasitic, okay? They are non-motile as well, but that's, I'm gonna test you on that. But what is uh, the best way to prevent malaria? So most of us are aware of the fact that this is transmitted by mosquitoes. So the best way to prevent it is gonna be mosquito abatement, right? So uh, nets and um, controlling standing water, introducing a ster sterile, genetically made sterile males into the population, um, as well as you know maybe prophylactic medications if you're traveling into one of these areas where it's endemic. So all of that can prevent you or the area from having issues with malaria. Uh, so a little extra bonus question here. We'll have some of these um, inserted along the way to try to, uh, you know, reactivate our memory about stuff that we may have learned about in other chapters. But what type of drug is used to treat malaria? Does anybody remember what it's called? What? So that is, so you're very close. So fluoroquinolones are associated with bacterial infections they affect like the DNA production, okay? Very close because the medication associated with this is quinine. So that's, I can understand the confusion there, yeah. So quinine is the tonic in um, tonic water, basically. It used to be anyways. So they're based on quinine.
but chloroquine is the one of the actual medications they use. All right, trypanosoma cruzi or cruzii, however you like to pronounce it. What disease does trypanosoma cruzi cause? Does anybody remember this one? This is Chagas disease, right? So anybody remember, given those bits of information, what type of organism this is? It's a protozoan, again. So um, yeah, I don't know, it's a protozoan. And then how is this one transmitted? This one is the kissing bug. Yeah, where it will like bite you and then poop near your mouth or eye. You can get the swollen areas near the eye where the bite happened that are called shagomas and that sort of stuff. Let's see if I left anything out. I really like made that one short. All right, acute encephalitis. So typically, what kind of pathogen is associated with um, acute encephalitis? Not a specific pathogen, but what kind? Do you guys remember this one? This can be viruses and even a little bit more specific. So if we're saying what kind of, uh, what kind of pathogen type? So <laughs> what I was going for here was arboviruses. So the term arbovirus is a virus that is transmitted by a biting insect. That could be mosquito or tick or anything like that, right? So these are the encephalitis um, causing uh, viruses that are transmitted by biting insects. So yeah, this is typically transmitted by biting insects. Uh, so what does encephalitis mean? Anybody know what it means? It's inflammation of the brain itself, yeah? So usually due to infection in our case. Yeah. All right, smallpox. Does anybody remember the name of the thing that causes smallpox? This one's gonna be variola major and it is a virus. What areas of the world experience this disease today? Anybody know that one? This one has been eradicated from the planet. We don't have this anymore. Um, that's thanks to the vaccine. The vaccine is made from a different virus called vaccinia, which is the first vaccine. This is the first vaccine. All of them basically named after that one. So what system of the body does this primarily affect? This is the skin exactly. So pretty obviously so, it'd be very disfiguring, like the nodule type rash, and vesicles. Okay, next we have Bordetella pertussis. Anybody know the disease associated with this one? Mm -hmm. Whooping cough, good job guys, that's a good one. Um, so yes, this is whooping cough. Um, what type of organism is this? You guys know that one? Bacteria, yeah, this is a bacteria. And how is this disease best prevented? The, yeah, exactly, that's gonna be the vaccine for this one. Best prevented by vaccine. So we have the Tdap or any derivatives of that that you might be getting during your lifetime that cover a lot of those toxoid based illnesses. Um, yeah. All right, pharyngitis. What does pharyngitis mean? Everybody know? Basically, yeah. So, so we would say specific of the, so, yes, so this is the pharynx, right? So that's just the throat in general. So inflammation of the throat, which pathogen is the most common cause of pharyngitis? You guys know this one? Strep throat, right? So this is gonna be streptococcus pyogenes for this one, right? Uh, one other disease, that streptococcus pyogenes is associated with that we have learned about in class. So here we're talking about strep throat. You guys remember any other disease? Huh? Scarlet fever, exactly, that's a good one. Um, so there's scarlet fever, there's rheumatic fever, which is like progressing on further from that. Um, it can be associated with impetigo. That's usually more commonly associated with staph though. Um, and then necrotizing fasciitis, oops, it's more commonly this organism. So what somewhat special trait, Now I say somewhat here because to me it's not special because a lot of bacteria actually do this, but what somewhat special trait makes this pathogen virulent? I'm sure you guys wouldn't be able to guess this and that's okay. This is um, Streptococcus pyogenes is more virulent because it is um, has gone through lysogenic conversion. So it's got toxins given to it by uh, phage that has infected it and incorporated into its genome, right? A lot of bacteria have that, but this very pronounced and obvious with S. pyogenes with strep. 
Let's see if I left anything out. When you said lysogenic, what was the second grade of the lysogenic part? Uh, uh, conversion. Here it is down here. I'll highlight it for you so you can see it or kind of see it. But anyways, there it is. Um, one of the ones I left out kind of glomerulonephritis due to the type three hypersensitivity immune complexes. This is all related to the strep throat sort of stuff, the progression of the disease. So uh, strep throat going into rheumatic fever or scarlet fever and then rheumatic fever. And then you get antibodies against it. Those antibodies create complexes that get stuck in um, the grammar or whatever. <laughs> um, anyways, it causes the uh, complexes to get stuck there and cause the inflammation in the kidneys. And it can be quite serious leading to permanent kidney damage. So that's one that comes up in um, that uh, hypersensitivity chapter, the immune diseases. Nope, that's not what I wanted. Okay, next one. Chlamydia trachomatis. What disease or diseases is associated with this pathogen? I know you guys can guess one, at least, right? Chlamydia, <laughs> yes, you're not wrong, right? This is the correct situation. So chlamydia, the other one that is associated with is trachoma. So they're both there in the name, technically. So chlamydia trachomatis, causes chlamydia, the STI, and um, trachoma, which is the most common um, cause of infection-related blindness. Basically. Okay. So what type of an organism is this? Do you guys remember? Bacteria. So this is bacteria, exactly. All right, so given the choice, so here's, here's another one, just bringing up your concepts if you can remember uh, between our drugs. Now, if you have clindamycin, Proziquantel or myconazole to treat this infection, which one would you choose and why? So this is a heavy one if you haven't looked back on your antibiotics and stuff like that in a while. So I'll get you through this. I would choose clindamycin. And this, specifically, this is an antibiotic that affects protein production in bacteria, but uh, proziquantel is associated with treating helminth infections. So it's not for bacterial infections. And then myconazole, typical azole, this is for treating a fungal infection. So we don't need that, right? So that's why we would choose clindamycin because it's an actual antibiotic. Antibiotics treat only bacterial infections. Let's make sure I didn't miss a thing. All right, next is treponema pallidum. Uh, what disease is this a pathogen associated with? Anybody remember this one? It was our last chapter, our most recent chapter. This is syphilis. All right, so treponema pallidum is the causative agent of syphilis. So what kind of organism, does anybody remember, is this? This is also bacteria. Yeah. So, um, and remember, it has that little spiral shape and that when it gets into the skin, it causes inflammation wherever it entered the skin. And how is this disease contracted? This one's an obvious one, right? Sexual contact. How does it progress? So, and this has hallmark signs and symptoms. There's three stages to syphilis that we learned about. The primary stage, we have that chanker or canker that is developed, right? The hard um, sore, it's kind of small, hard sore. It is painful, but it's kind of defined. Wherever the organism got in, that sore will um, exist. Then we can move on to secondary syphilis. Uh, yeah, that's gonna be associated with like fever and um, lymphadenopathy, so swollen lymph nodes. But more importantly for the second, we have the rash, the brown rash. So it's pretty unique looking rash. It can be all over the body, but typically seen on the uh, palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. And then in tertiary or latent syphilis, which is the third stage, that's where we're gonna see progression of uh, neurosyphilis into dementia, and that, that sort of stuff, blindness and everything associated with it. Okay, oh, and the gummas or whatever that even is, I don't know, all that stuff, but yeah, definitely dementia is the big one there. So how is this disease treated? Anybody know that one? Yes, yes, antibiotics, specifically penicillin. Exactly, that's what sort of like made it not as much of an issue, really like seriously not an issue anymore. All right, um, all right, here's another one. What is the difference between a sign and a symptom? And give an example of each. So there's a little bit of a deviation there. So what is a sign? What kind of, what is that? Yeah, so it is objective. So anything you can like observe or record or confirm yourself is gonna be a sign. 
So an example would be like taking someone's temperature or even feeling like swollen lymph nodes. If you can not notice these things and you know mark them down as you experienced it, then that is a sign. A symptom is subjective. So your patient's telling you they're in pain or they're nauseous or something like that. You can't verify that. You just have to go by what they're saying. There's a lot for this one. So bear with me while I check it. Yeah, that's basically what I said. Keep in mind that while nausea itself might be a symptom because you can't verify it, vomiting is definitely a sign. Yeah, you can see that. <laughs> so don't, don't think that they're, because they're related that they would be the same. All right, this is gas gangrene. Anybody know the pathogen for this one? Yes, very close. So it is bacteria and it is Clostridium perfringens. All right, so what other illness is this associated with Clostridium perfringens? Anybody know that? It's a food, like a, a food um, poison disease, right? So not true infection, uh, but just like we talked about with staph, there's a toxin that it produces that can lead to illness from it, but basically, yeah. So what stain would help you identify this? You know, it's Clostridium perfringens, anybody know? Um, close, at least you're guessing something that exists. <laughs> I'm happy for you with this one. So this is the endospore stain. Yeah, so Clostridium and Bacillus, yeah? see. All right. Uh, why would hyperbaric oxygen treatment help this infection? It's a little bit important to know because we haven't gotten rid of gas gangrene. It's still going to come around and you might see if you work in an ER or something like that. But um, hyperbaric oxygen is now commonly used to treat gas gangrene. This is because uh, clostridium species have to be in an anaerobic environment to be virulent and to make their endospores. So they won't be doing any of that if oxygen is there. So they are anaerobic organisms. They don't do well with oxygen. Yeah. Cool, Clostridium perfringens. All right, flu is next. So yeah, what type of organism is this? Virus, yes. So is fever common with the flu? Yeah. Yes, it is. So not so much with colds, right? What are the two ways that new strains will come into existence um, with the flu? And if we can briefly explain them. So I know you guys probably remember the concepts for this one. Uh, the two ways, um, antigenic drift and antigenic shift. Drift is just, you know, uh, minor mutations that'll just happen naturally. Shift is whenever we have reassortment of the genome segments within another host, right? Between two viruses to create a new strain. So those are those two, antigenic drift, antigenic shift. All right, Tamiflu. We use Tamiflu as a treatment for the flu. This is gonna fall within our antiviral category um, for the, whatever chapter that was, 12 or whatever. Um, Tamiflu is used as a treatment for flu. How does it work? Tamiflu affects the neuraminidase function. So flu, we talk about it as H1N1, H something and something. H is hemagglutinin, that refers to how it attaches and the fact that it causes the blood cells to stick together. Neuraminidase is uh, something on the surface of the virus that helps it uh, break down mucus, make it more liquidy so it's easier for it to get it to cells and not get swept away. Um, as well as helps the virus get into and bud out of cells. So Tamiflu prevents the function of neuraminidase. All right, cool. Any questions about any of this so far? I keep forgetting to ask if you guys have questions. You can always stop me, please do. Okay, next we have ringworm. What type of pathogen causes ringworm? Fungus, exactly. I'm sure you guys will never forget it. What is one location, just one, on the body where we see um, ringworm commonly? It be a lot of places, right? Pretty much anywhere on the skin. Um, but yeah, we have very commonly on the feet for athlete's foot. That's the same as what we're talking about here. Um, just on your skin, if you touch like, I don't know, a cat or something is usually what I touched when I got ringworm. But you get the little ring, um, literally that this is named after. You can get it on the scalp, you can get it in the beard, um, you can get it in the genital region, you can get it pretty much anywhere. All right. Uh, given the choice, here's another one. Given the choice with ringworm, you're going to treat this with tetracycline, ivermectin, 
or myconazole. Great job, guys. Yes, exactly. So myconazole is azole. We're going to use that to treat fungal infection. So good job. That's going to be myconazole. Right. Now we have Candida albicans. What type of organism is this one? We know it's yeast. So this is yeast. Does anybody know what a yeast is? It's a fungus. Yeah. So it's a fungus. It's a yeast. It's a fungus. So what type of infection does this cause whenever um, it's associated with female genitalia? So I don't mean yeast infection necessarily because it's duh. But like anybody know a more specific medical term for what happens if you get the yeast infection. So this is vaginitis. There's two organisms that can cause vaginitis, which is actual inflammation of the vagina. One of them we're going to get to in a little bit, but the other one is candida albicans. Okay. Um, as far as what we would see with symptoms in that case, so a yeast infection that is causing vaginitis, um, curd-like colonies that develop on the inside of the vagina, um, you know, discharge and perhaps itchiness. So is this organism usually part of the normal healthy biome of the female genitalia? Yes, yes it is in small amounts. It is normal to have. You take antibiotics, you clear out the bacteria in the area. Now this guy will overgrow and you have a yeast infection. That's pretty commonly how this would occur. <laughs> Sometimes I don't put any like extra stuff. It's just like, yes, no. All right, hepatitis C virus. What is hepatitis? What does that mean? Infection. Good, so this is uh, inflammation of the liver, like we say, typically due to infection in this case. So what is a defining symptom of hepatitis in general? Anybody know? This one's not really a trick, yeah, it's jaundice, yeah. So jaundice, anybody know what jaundice is caused by really? Billy Rubin, that is in, yeah. Yeah, so whenever you have inflammation in your liver, you will break apart, um, you know, the bilirubin essentially that's in the liver and that will deposit in the skin and cause yellowing of the skin. Um, and it's very, very itchy over time as well. So yeah, that's jaundice. So how is this disease transmitted? Yeah, yes. <laughs> Right, so bleach your needles. Um, this is <laughs> this is blood trans uh, blood transmission, right? So it has to be blood, blood. Not this is not a sexual contact. This is not people oral like what we might see with other hepatitis. Hepatitis B, um, we would see um, is sexually transmitted as well as blood, of course. And then hepatitis A is fecal oral. Hepatitis A, you can just get over it on your own. Um, hepatitis B, you can develop cancer as a result of it. It's called hepatocarcinoma. And that's because in hepatitis B, like I'm using this as a means to get onto the other viruses, so we learn about those as well. But um, hepatitis B is a DNA virus that incorporates itself into your genome in a weird way. So this is the one that goes DNA to RNA, and then it uses its RNA to make more DNA that gets put into your genome. So it has reverse transcriptase like HIV does. Pretty neat, weird, and you know, it seems unnecessary, but yeah. So when it does that and starts its DNA in there, it is uh, gonna make you more likely to have problems with how your genes work and that can lead to cancer. Um, how about hepatitis C? Does it have a treatment or a vaccine or both? Anybody know? No, no vaccine. Yeah, no vaccine. Does it have any treatments? So there are effective treatments for hepatitis C nowadays that are reliably effective. So you can um, get treated. It's not like a quick and easy pill or something, but it does um, work. It is effective. Um, hep A and hep B, they both have vaccines. So uh, da, 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 let's see. If I'm just... All right, next is Trichomonas vaginalis. What disease is this pathogen associated with? Do you guys know? So this one is like, I will say, well, it kind of says it at the bottom, but anyways, Trichomonas vaginalis, this is associated with vaginitis. So this is the other organism. So we had Candida albicans with the yeast infection and we have Trichomonas vaginalis. Um, it's like the most common non-viral sexually transmitted disease. So obviously the answer is how is this pathogen transmitted? Sexually, right? So the STI. 
What type of organism is this? Do you guys know that bacteria, fungi, protozoa, whatever? This, yes. So it is a, a parasite technically. Parasites are uh, gonna include your protozoa and your helminths. So this is a protozoa. Good. All right, urinary tract infections. What's the most common cause? Bacteria. Yeah, so bacteria, of course, yeah. So E. coli, specifically, right? So E. coli is the most common cause. Where does the bacteria come from? And what is the correct term associated with this, if anybody knows? So where does it come from? Is it like transmitted from somebody else? Is it unprotected? Okay, so this is from your own GI tract, yeah. Could be from poor hygiene. It could be just you know, smashing everything together during sex and not urinating afterwards and whatever, but it's usually your own E. coli that's causing this. There, it's 80% um, E. coli and 20% other fecal <laughs> associated with bacteria, um, like uh, Enterococcus faecalis, which some of you may, well, somebody probably had in the lab as they're unknown. Um, these are all common, you know, fecally associated, call them enteric bacteria, or you know, also we'll use them as coliforms as identifiers of, you know, contamination of water. So there's that, but, um, but yeah. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. The correct term for that is endogenous. So when you have a disease coming from within your own body, that's endogenous. That can occur in the case of any sort of opportunistic infection, um, like including yeast infections and stuff like that, right? So that's also endogenous. So is this more likely to affect males or females or is it equal and why? Females. Females, and why is that? Shorter urethra, right? So women have shorter urethras, they're more likely to have the bacteria travel up into the bladder and cause problems. Let's make sure we got that. All right, next is Ascaris lumbricoides. So what disease is this? You know? This one, um, this one's a, this one's giant intestinal roundworm. Okay, <laughs> it's also called ascariasis. Uh, so it could go either way. So yeah, so we know that this is clearly a worm. Um, what is the scientific classification for it? So like, so helminth. And anybody know what kind of helminth it would be? So this is a roundworm. Yes, it is. I'm so proud of you. Well, I just did one of the things over it yesterday. Uh -huh. I can't remember the full part of it. It's yeah. Like any, uh... Yeah, you'd recognize it if it was on the test. I, I bet you anything. Nematode. Yeah. Okay. So roundworms are nematodes. And why is cough a symptom in this it's one? Like one of those things to the eggs, right? Exactly. Yeah. So whenever during their life cycle, they migrate into the. Um, lung area and then you cough them out and they get swallowed and it kind of starts over with the cycle again. They get stuck in a sort of type of life cycle like that. They need to get out of the body for them to complete it, but yeah, they can do that for a long time. That's gross. There's pictures of people like literally with worms out of their mouths. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. All right, chronic diarrhea. <laughs> so this is gonna be diarrhea that lasts like two weeks or more, right? Um, diarrhea is going to be a loose stool, three or more loose stools in a like 24 hour period. So abbreviation for the most common bacterial cause of chronic diarrhea, you guys probably aren't going to remember this, um, EAEC, and that stands for um, enteroaggregative E. coli, <laughs> okay, EAEC, that's, that's a fun one. For uh, that bacterial chronic diarrhea, EAEC, what is this usually, like what other thing going on is that usually associated with? This is gonna be HIV infection. So yeah, you're kind of right, right? So EAEC, E. coli, this bacterial cause of diarrhea is chronic associated with HIV infection or other issues with, severe issues with immune system. All right, we also have a chronic diarrhea that is caused by a protozoan. Does anybody know that organism? This one is Giardia. So it's Giardia duodenalis or Lamblia. They renamed it. I call it Lamblia. Um, they renamed it to duodenalis, but whatever. So that is a protozoan. And how do you get Giardia? Anybody know? Yes. 
Exactly. So this is contaminated water. That water can look completely clear. And um, yeah, if you don't boil it, then it could be harboring Giardia and you could have, this is a chronic diarrhea that lasts for months. And they say it is um, greasy malodorous stools. And I just, I can't, will never forget that greasy and the malodorous just because I'm just like, man, what does that mean? I don't want to know. I don't want to know what that means. Leave me out. I'll never forget it. Okay. Next is tamia solium. What diseases does this pathogen cause? Disease or diseases? So this is a uh, tapeworm. <clears throat> so associated with having tapeworm, right? So I don't know what to call that tapeworm. <laughs> so um, the other one that is related to is going to be um, cystocercosis. So that is whenever you get the proglottid, which is that little egg sac that'll break off as little segments. Um, if you ingest that, not associated with like coming from meat that you eat, if you just take it, like if you were to take it as a pill to lose weight, for example, um, it can travel into the brain and insist in there. So they create little cyst pockets. It's very hard to treat it because if you rupture the cyst, it causes massive inflammation in the brain and can quickly kill somebody. So it's very difficult to treat or remove those. Yeah. So do we see these either of these diseases, the just tapeworm general or cystocercosis in the United States? Yes, we do. Um, both kind of, yes, yeah, so we'll see some of the first aspect, but more commonly known actually for the cystocercosis, which is pretty rare, just by the way, don't freak out about it too much. What is the scientific classification for this organism? So I know this is the helminth. What kind of helminth is this one? So there's two more words for this one. Yes, so yes. So on the way to that one, on the way to that one, we have platyhelminthes. So that's the flatworms, right? There's two kinds of flatworms, the flukes and the flatworms. Um, this is a flatworm and we call those cestodes. Yeah? And the flukes are called trematodes. Yeah, so those are the words that they are gonna appear probably again at some point. Let's make sure. Right. Neisseria meningitidis. So what type of organism is this? Yes, so bacteria. So bacteria cause the worst kinds of meningitis. This is obviously meningitis. Um, it's kind of in the name. Uh, so what is meningitis? What does that mean? Yes, so inflammation of the meninges due to um, this infection. So what, what's the meninges? Anybody know? So close, you guys are close. You're in the right track. I'm, you know, we're, we're there. So it is the covering of the brain in, in particular. So there's three levels to it, like the dura mater. And uh, I don't know the rest. So. <laughs> Go ask Dr. Shearer. <laughs> but yeah, that's those ones, right? So that's what that is referring to. Is that's the meninges. I do know what that means. So I do know dura mater. It's the only one I learned. Um. So what is the defining symptom with this particular kind of meningitis that allows us? So this is, we're gonna have a rash. So petechiae that's associated with this that looks like a rash all over the body. The other types of meningitis do not exhibit that rash. This is the deadliest kind of meningitis that you can contract. Um, it's gonna be the most, yeah, most deadly if you get that, that but it's not the most common. This, yeah, this, I did not check my spell check apparently, but yes, petechial rash. All right, Enterobius vermicularis. Um, every time I see this one, vermicularis, I always think of like vermicelli, like noodles. <laughs> and I'm sure that is what it's meant to be referring to also, but like, I, yeah, it doesn't make it sound good. All right, what disease does this pathogen cause? Anybody know? So this one, I kind of gave it away with me talking about it being like noodles. This is pinworms. So what's the defining symptom of having pinworms? Anybody know this? Yes, an itchy butt or you know itchy anus. <laughs> do we have this illness in the United States? Yes. yes, we do. Absolutely, we see it in children mostly. That's where that comes from. <laughs> 
Well, they are, yeah. <laughs> All righty. Um, Nyseria, which we just saw in Nyseria. Nyseria gonorrhea this time. Obviously, this is gonorrhea. What type of organism is this? Again, bacteria, just like we saw with Nyseria meningitis. It's, they're related, so. Bacteria is gram negative. It is a diplococcus, which is a pretty defining feature. The reason I bring that up is if you guys were ever to have any patients that had either Neisseria gonorrhea or Neisseria meningitis, they're very defined by those diplococci shapes. They're gram negative. That is a cocci, which is, first of all, you don't see a ton of that. They're usually bacilli when they're gram negative. But um, these are diplococci, so like in these little like pairs, always very, very characteristic. So that's an important characteristic to remember about um, if people are observing that in a microscope. So how is this disease transmitted? How do you get gonorrhea? Sexual contact. What is the biggest concern with this disease? Exactly. So this is antibiotic resistant. It's becoming very serious to the point where some strains are untreatable. Um, so our little bonus question here, what disease does having gonorrhea increase your chances of contracting? HIV. So yes, so the inflammation caused by having gonorrhea makes it more likely that you will get HIV if you have sex with somebody who is HIV positive while you have that. Good job, guys. Probably avoid, uh, never mind. <laughs> barrier, barrier protection, I would say. Barrier protection and bleach your needles, and you should be okay there. <laughs> dengue, fever. How is dengue transmitted? This is going to be mosquito bites here. Um, what type of illness is dengue fever? So this is a hemorrhagic fever. And what causes hemorrhagic fevers to exhibit their characteristic trait, like hemorrhaging? So we're gonna have uh, fragility or friability of the actual vessels. So it causes enough breakdown of those vessels that they can just rupture. And then you get bleeding. Some of them obviously get worse bleeding than others. That's dengue. All right, Shigella dysenteriae. So this is obviously going to cause dysentery. What's dysentery? Exactly, this is bloody diarrhea. What type of organism is this? You know, remember that one? This is a bacteria, exactly. So it, it makes a toxin. Um, it shares this toxin with STEC, which we'll get to in a little bit. But um, what is that toxin called? It's kind of related to the name. It's called Shiga toxin. And then what is STEC? Anybody know that? So STEC is Shiga toxin producing E. coli. So that's kind of associated there. Um, this is where we will be talking about E. coli 0157H7, the ones that we're concerned about with the like, news, you know, breakout outbreaks of E. coli and all that sort of stuff. What other important illness is it associated with? So we know dysentery. Um, it's also associated with hemolytic uremic syndrome. So basically from breaking down blood vessels, um, not blood vessels, blood cells, excuse me, breaking down blood cells from this infection causes issues with like the kidney function and stuff like that. And that can become um, very damaging and lead to anemia and stuff too. And uh, how are these pathogens transmitted? How do you get Shigella? How do you get STEC? So this is like poop associating with your food or your water. Yeah, so it can be in either place. So this is fecal oral, yeah. Diarrhea leads to more diarrhea. Yeah, typically we associate these fecal oral situations with food. Um, Streptococcus pneumoniae, this is a good one. Streptococcus pneumoniae, what type of organism is this one? Bacteria, absolutely. So uh, in fact, this is a gram positive. If we go back to looking at streptococcus, strepto, chain, coccus, round cells, right? Um, what disease or diseases is this most famously associated with? So we have in its name, pneumonia, right? So we got pneumonia. Does anybody remember the other thing that it's really common for? 
so that you're close. So <laughs> uh, so just because streptococcus, that is a streptococcus. That one is streptococcus pyogenes. Streptococcus pneumoniae is the number one cause of communally acquired pneumonia. Duh. Um, also the number one cause of communally acquired meningitis. So this is the most common of the meningitis bacteria. Um, there is a vaccine for this. This is also called the pneumococcus. You guys know about that. So usually as you get older, they recommend that you get this because of the pneumonia and the meningitis. Um, okay, is this always a pathogen or is it ever associated with normal flora? Yeah, so this can be part of your normal flora. This is actually another important one. Um, when we talk about group B streptococcal um, infection of the newborn, if you have group B strep as part of your normal flora, especially in the vagina, which 10 to 40% of women do have, um, and, and usually your OB should be checking, um, then at about week 36, 35 to 37, yes, 35 to 37 in the pregnancy, they'll treat you with some sort of antibiotic, doxycycline, um, usually ampicillin or penicillin, something like that. But anyways, they wait till then to treat because they will get rid of the strep altogether. But they also want to be sure it doesn't like come back to you from other, you know, you probably share it with like a husband or somebody as well. So they don't want you to regrow that before the baby is born. It can cause this, um, like just we talked about with streptococcus pneumoniae, pneumonia and meningitis in that little baby that you just gave birth to. So that's why we want to get rid of that. And like I said, 10 to 40% of women have this naturally in their vaginas. So we want to be sure that we're checking for that. So that's important, especially if you're going to be dealing with pregnant women. Let's make sure I got all of that. Okay, so this is supposed to have like a little uh, fly in type of a thing, but I didn't, whatever. So Staphylococcus aureus, um, other than MRSA, what diseases is Staphylococcus aureus associated with? Two. All right, so Staph is associated with impetigo. It's the number one cause of impetigo. It can actually cause necrotizing fasciitis. It's less common than what you see with Streptococcus pyogenes, but it can. Um, it can be associated with uh, healthcare related um, pneumonia. Um, yeah, so cellulitis, which is kind of related to MRSA, but anyways, it's associated with a lot of diseases potentially. And it, even things like pneumonia, like I already said pneumonia, but even things like um, I'm going to think about other diseases because I'm thrown off, but it can be associated with a lot of diseases, just less commonly than what you see with the skin diseases, right? All right, uh, is this always a pathogen or is it sometimes part of the flora? Yes, sometimes part of the flora and about 4% of the population, um, you'll carry this as part of your normal flora. If you find that uh, you're like you have kids and your kids tend to be getting sick a lot with staph infections, you're probably a carrier of staph. Um, you could also go, can go the same way with strep. So how would you treat staphylococcal food poisoning? Any guesses? Um, that's a good guess because it is bacteria, right? Um, staphylococcal food poisoning, which was another disease that I didn't mention, I couldn't remember. Um, food poisoning is really caused by the toxin that the organism produces. So in this case, staph is producing a toxin. The toxin will get you sick within one to six hours of consuming the meal and last about 24 hours. So if you get sick pretty quick after having a meal and you feel better within 24 hours, it was probably staph toxin that did it. So how do you treat that? Well, antibiotics aren't gonna help because the toxin's already there doing its business. So what you do is just let it go. Yeah, hydrate, exactly. <laughs> right. All right, next we have Oncocerca volvulus. Anybody know the disease for this one? This is river blindness. Um, what type of organism causes river blindness? Do you guys know that one? It is a helminth, exactly. So this is a worm. Um, it also is virulent because it has a bacteria in it called Wolbachia, and it wouldn't make people ill if it didn't have it. So that's kind of a weird thing. So the bac bacteria lives in the worm and that's why it makes people sick. So, but yeah, you get it. And then I believe it's fecal oral transmission. 
and it, it goes into the eye like a trans, you know, we've talked about the worms, they move through the tissues and yeah, it's terrifying. Chikungunya, what type of organism causes the illness associated with this? What type of organism? So this is a virus. Do you guys know the illness? So this is a hemorrhagic fever again. And so how is this one transmitted, do you think? This one's mosquito, just like dengue. Okay. We do have this in the United States. It's not super common, but it is here. Yeah. Clostridium tetani. What type of organism is that one? Bacteria, yeah, so we should know that by now because we've had a few of them. Um, so this causes tetanus, clearly. What type of serious symptom is associated with tetanus? So a lot of people will jump straight to um, lockjaw for this one, but more specifically or broadly, depending on how you look at it, uh, this is going to be associated with spastic paralysis. So that just means your muscles um, contract and they can't relax. So muscles cannot relax with this one. That's called spastic paralysis. Why would spastic paralysis kill you? That's one thing, but also if we were talking only even just about like the voluntary muscles, your diaphragm is a voluntary muscle. And so that one can seize up and then you would suffocate. And that's usually how you will die from tetanus. So if we were gonna perform a stain to look for this one, what stain would we use for this one? Endospore, okay, clostridium. All clostridium, all bacilli, bacillus. All right, this is our last one. This is Clostridium botulinum. Of course, I'd follow up with the same sort of deal. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So what type of serious symptom is this associated with? So we said spastic paralysis for tetanus. What about for botulism? So this is flaccid paralysis with this one. That's why we use it to like, you know, paralyze essentially the muscles of your face or whatever, or even um, stop migraines because it's basically stopping transmission of signals. So, so the next question is, how does it cause this? So I say it stops transmission of signals so you can't contract. What's specifically happening is there is a transmitter called acetylcholine and that is kind of what governs contraction of your muscles. And the um, botulism toxin will block the release of that acetylcholine. So that's how that causes paralysis. Um, obviously you die from this because you can't breathe in. So that's a pretty clear, can't breathe in because this one's just, you can't do it. The other one you can't breathe in because it's all seized up. So how is this transmitted? How do you get botulism? So be in your food, um, typically canned foods. If they have been canned improperly or there's some sort of rupture in the can or anything like that, then um, the clostridium can you know get in that way. So I would say most clostridium species are anaerobic. Um, they all make endospores. So even though you might think you're sterilizing your cans, if you're not actually sterilizing them, the endospores can survive that. And then that would lead to, you know, botulism, right? Does anybody have any questions about any of that? Okay, so my little message here, remember there are more illnesses than this. Um, be sure you go through the review slides. You guys know what it is. Um, yeah, and this doesn't cover everything you need to know about these diseases. 